Bonjour. Um, good morning, folks. Sorry, my French is terrible. My son speaks French. My wife speaks French. My French is not there. Um, my talk is online, as always, on talks.php.net. You can find me on Twitter as well, at Rasmus. We're going to be talking about coding and dreaming this morning. First, <clears throat> lots of coding. I started out doing this stuff many, many years ago. Um, 1993 is when I started first doing web development. And most of my code back then looked like this. And I don't expect you to read it. It's unreadable. This is a CGI program written in C. And you end up writing your HTML inside your C program. So anytime you wanted to change something trivial, you have to recompile and redeploy to the server. And it was terrible. <coughs> Sorry. So back then, most people, most normal people, switched to writing their web applications in Perl using something called CGI PM. And now that same application, it's just a simple application that puts up a form that takes the name and an age and does something with it. I still didn't like it. First of all, Perl was pretty slow. Having to fork and exec the Perl binary on every single web request was terrible. On 1993 hardware, getting a Perl interpreter up and running was horrible. It's not much better today. Um, but back then, it was really, really bad. And this was long before Mod Perl, obviously. But I didn't like this either. You're also programming your HTML. I wanted something that looked more like that. I wanted my HTML to look like HTML. I've always hated writing one language in another language because finding bugs and trying to work your way backwards to figure out why it didn't do what you thought it did is way too difficult. I want one step from what I'm doing to my solution. And this, this was my approach to solving the web problem in 1994. So nice HTML that looks like HTML. And where you need something dynamic, just toss it in. I didn't have curly braces back then. So you had colon and if, end if, for, end for, things like that. Mostly because it was just easier to write the parser that way. My initial parser was one big state machine. I didn't use Bison. I didn't use Flex. I didn't use anything like that. I had just written it in C, in my head, basically, left to right. Um, <laughs> and it was hard. Um, things like basic math is quite hard to actually interpret left to right, because 2 plus 3 times 4, you can't do the plus first, right? You have to do the multiplication, then you have to backtrack, and then, oh, man. So I ended up having to read a book. Hate that. Um, <laughs> reading a book on, on compilers and trying to figure out, OK, there must be an easier way, because I was getting lost in, in building my state machine as it was getting more and more complex. Um, but it grew. Um, it grew quickly. It grew right along with the web because many other people apparently liked the approach that I had taken of having HTML and just putting in a tiny little bit of markup. I think it was mostly because people weren't, I mean, the people who were tasked with solving the web problem weren't the programmers back in the mid 90s. It tended to be like the documentation team at a company, for example, the tech writers. Mostly because when the web first hit, nobody knew what to do with it. But you look around and you see other companies on the web, and the boss says, OK, we need to be on the web. Let's put our documentation online. I mean, that's the first obvious thing. And then what happened was that the documentation team became the web team because they were the first people that the boss said, hey, put your stuff online. And the documentation team, OK. Microsoft Word, save as HTML, oof, done, woohoo. But then the boss comes and says, OK, well, let's put our product catalog online. It's in this DB2 database over here. Put it online, documentation team. And then suddenly, the documentation team says, well, Word, save, dynamic website? No, that doesn't work. Right? So they, they struggled, they looked around for how can we take our HTML and how can we mark it up a little bit to make it more dynamic? How can we toss an SQL query into it um, without really 
doing much else. We don't want to write an entire application. We just want a little bit of dynamic content into our site. And I think that's what really caught on with people, was that the, the learning curve was really shallow and people could kind of carefully get into the web without having to really get immersed into it. That wasn't at all what I had intended with PHP. When I did this, I released something called the PHP Tools. Um, and these tools were a bunch of different things that would, it would do a guest book, it would do count how many visitors have been on your web page, things like that. And those things were examples of how to build a tool. And my idea was that PHP would be a wrapper or a framework for building your applications in C. And then you could expose your C code via my framework and via additional tags in the language itself. And because writing a web application in a loosely typed language is crazy. Why would you do that? Um, I still kind of feel that way. I mean, I'm a C developer. I, I write stuff in C, in strongly typed, compiled language, right? Um, the world didn't agree with me, which is okay. I, I'm okay with that. Um, so, when I saw that the world didn't agree with me, I started to sort of, first of all, I said, okay, I can't do this by myself. This thing is going crazy. So by late 1996 or so, it has just gotten way too big. The number of bug reports I was getting from people and the number of just things happening, I couldn't keep up anymore. Um, so by early 1997, I had picked basically the, the six most annoying people that kept asking me for things and kept sending me bug reports and kept yelling at me for how crappy my parser was or how bad my Oracle extension was or all this stuff. And I basically said, okay, fine. You obviously know way more about Oracle than I do. Here, the Oracle code is yours. Put all of those bug things or all the fixes you wanted, put them in, it's yours. If other people complain, it's your problem, not mine. Um, and I basically did that to most of PHP. I handed off all the pieces to the people who were screaming the loudest and said, guys, just do it, um, which was hard to do for me because initially I had rewritten every patch. Every patch that would come in, I would say, no, I, that's not how I would do it. I need to fix that. But I gave up. There was, there was just no way that I could oversee everything. And there was just, PHP is too broad. There are too many different databases, too many different libraries. There's no way I could know enough about each component to, to be that heavily involved. So I sort of pushed everything out to other people to the point where there was nothing left for me, actually. And I was like, oh, wait a second. And I, I grabbed a few things back and, and kept working on those. Um, but what I really worked on was the, the ecosystem around it. A language is completely useless if it doesn't work. And in order for a language to work, it has to have all the components that you need to solve the problem. In our case, this problem was the web problem. And to solve the web problem, you need an operating system, you need a web server, you need some kind of back-end storage, and then you need some glue that ties it all together. PHP was this glue, but it had to work well with the web server. So I wrote the first mod PHP, the Apache module for PHP, to make sure we don't have to fork and exec a new process on every request. Um, I also hacked up the database at the time, which was called MiniSQL. Um, this was before MySQL existed. And there were things like, well, if I do a select star from a table, I might get 100,000 rows. But I'm never going to show 100,000 lines on my web page. I'm going to show the first 10 or the first 20, and then I'm going to have next page. There's no point waiting for 100,000 rows to come back across the wire. Um, so I wrote the limit clause. So I added the limit clause to MiniSQL just to make sure that, okay, look, I'm doing a select, but I only want the first 10. Don't send the rest. I don't want to wait for it. Um, so that was mostly what I was focusing on, trying to figure out, okay, we have this PHP glue. How do we make it work better with the tools around it? And that's where the LAMP stack came from. And that ecosystem is really the key to PHP. The fact that we support so many different technologies, so many extensions are out there, plus it works really well with the various tools around it. 
There are thousands of languages in the world. There are less than a hundred that are in use, right? And that's the differentiator, I think. Why do people use PHP? I'm not a language guy. I don't even like programming. But still, people use it because I took the time and the whole PHP team over the years took the time to make sure that it works well with other technologies around it. And it's actually a very pragmatic, practical, sort of very simple way of getting from one point to the other. And that's generally what people look for. People don't actually care that much about syntax. They don't actually care about that much about sort of the general atmosphere of the language. They want to solve a problem. And if this tool solves the problem, perfect, use it. And that's what we're seeing. Um, and a piece of that is where do you host your code? In the mid and late 90s, everyone was on a shared ISP. Just the virtual host next to a thousand other people. And this is where Mod Perl, for example, got it completely wrong. Mod Perl lets you modify every single stage of the web request in the Apache web server. So you can get in and, and change everything. Right from the very initial request coming in, you can change how that request gets routed to a virtual host, for example. So one virtual host running Mod Perl can grab all the requests for every other virtual host. So the ISP says, well, oh, no way, we can't install Mod Perl because it's too powerful, right? PHP only hooked the content generation hook. There were ways, there was something called Apache hooks where you can actually set up PHP to take the other hooks as well. But by default, it only took the content generation hook which made ISPs happy. And I added things like timeouts um, and other small features that ISPs liked so that one person couldn't just do an infinite loop and eat the entire server. Um, and scaling is interesting. Scaling, I mostly just, right from day one, I said, I don't want to have anything to do with scale problems. This web thing is growing so fast Scaling is going to be a continuous problem for the next 100 years. I don't want that to be my problem. So I didn't want to build an application server. I didn't want to worry about state in any way whatsoever. I wanted to sort of build on how the web was built, which is a very discrete request comes in, you generate some content, you send the response back, and then you tear everything down. So the perfect sandbox model that basically says that you can't tell that after a request, there's nothing that should be different with PHP itself from one request to the next, which means it doesn't matter which server handles the request, which means you can just add servers next to each other, as many as you want, and scale it up. If it doesn't scale, it's your fault. It's not my fault, because PHP doesn't have anything that doesn't scale. Anything that doesn't scale is stuff that you added. And it's your problem, it's you need to figure out how to scale your database backend or whatever database storage you have, it's, it's not at the language level. And scaling the other direction is actually much harder. As geeks, we think about scale as in scaling up. And we always want to make things faster, make it use less memory, make it more efficient. Um, we like to complicate things as well. As long as it somehow improves it, we don't care about complexity. Scaling down is very unnatural for us. But that's one of the keys to PHP. How do you scale down something so that a weekend warrior who knows nothing about programming can solve his problem? Someone with a really good idea, but who knows nothing about the web, how do we get his ideas online? And that's where PHP really hit home with people, I think, is that that on-ramp, that learning curve of getting people started was so shallow. Um, things like Register Globals was a key piece of this. Being able to explain to people, here's a form, there are form fields named name and age. All you need to do is echo out dollar name, dollar age. They're right there, don't worry about it. Any form fields you create, you have those variables. People think of Register Globals as horrible, terrible, right? But remember, this was long before anything like cross-site scripting or stuff like that. Mid-90s, there was no cross-site scripting. There was no JavaScript, right? So the web changed a lot in the last 20 years. 
making some of those early features look really bad in retrospect. But um, 15 minutes? What do you need 15 minutes? Sorry, the organizers. Is it 45 minutes? I talk or half an hour? Oh, you want 15 minutes questions? Okay, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> All right, we'll go a bit faster. Um, performance, we talked about it, shared nothing, SQL limits, security things, um, mostly geared at ISPs. All these things together added up to an ecosystem that made PHP viable and useful and very practical for people. And a lot of these features that people ask me about now, like why did he do it? We talked about register globals, magic quotes because I was lazy. I only supported one database when I added magic quotes, so at the time it just made sense. I didn't know I'd be here 20 years later. This was a tool I built for me initially, and for me, I understood how magic quotes works. It works with my database, no problem, right? Um, why the dollar signs? Honestly, because it was easier to write the parser that way, and I wanted to have easy string interpolation so that you can have inside the quoted string, you need some kind of identifier that says this is a variable inside the quoted string. And I like the consistency of having the same delimiter inside and outside, so you can always just scan across, here's a variable, here's a variable, whether it's in a quoted string or not. Naming inconsistencies. PHP is actually very, very consistent, just not in the way you think. <laughs> PHP is completely consistent vertically in the sense that it's a very thin wrapper on top of hundreds of underlying libraries. And most of the naming is just one-to-one -one mapping of the underlying library function um, to PHP. So people who know the Oracle API, for example, are very familiar with how to use it from PHP because, well, if you know the C API, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Same with the MySQL functions. It's a one-to-one -one mapping with the underlying library that we're wrapping. And for speed of development, it was just easier to map these things one-to-one -one, uh, versus anything else. Also, like, people always ask me about um, key, key haystack stuff, or needle haystack stuff. Every array function is needle haystack. Every string function is haystack needle. It's not that weird. Just remember, it's actually consistent in that sense. And that comes from the underlying functions as well. Case and sense of the function names, that one I should have changed early on. It was initially because HTML in the mid-90s, nobody could agree whether it should be uppercase or lowercase, and I wanted people to just be able to slide in their PHP tags, and I didn't want to be part of that religious fight, whether HTML should be uppercase or lowercase. Now, lowercase eventually won, but that was not very clear in 1993. All right, let's get into the present. PHP 5.5 is our current stable version. Most people are not using it yet. You should be. Are there anybody here still on PHP 5.2? You won't admit it. That's very, very good. Because I would kick you out and basically say, you should not be here. You don't have time to be here. You should be home upgrading your servers. Because nobody should be on 5.2 anymore. You shouldn't even be on 5.3 anymore. You should be at least on 5.4. Let me try to convince you to get to 5.5 this weekend. 4.9. Okay. Uh, so, performance improvements in 5.5. A lot of stuff has gone into making the engine faster. Um, there was actually a huge jump from 5.3 to 5.4. A smaller jump from 5.4 to 5.5, unless you don't have an opcode cache. We added an opcode cache by default now, finally, in 5.5. So now, with every new release of PHP, there will always be a perfectly working opcode cache, hopefully. We improved nested calls. When I say we, I mean Dimitri. Um, <laughs> so if you have heavily nested calls, heavily recursive calls, by pre-allocating the stack, we can actually execute that a lot faster because we spend less time allocating memory. So if you have a lot of recursive code, moving to 5.5, we'll, you'll see a big improvement. Other things, generators. So a generator is just a shortcut for doing basically an iterator that returns values on every call, right? So you add a yield 
at the spot in the function where you want to yield the next value, and then it maintains its state. The next time you call it, it's going to just keep executing at that point. So it'll keep going to the next iteration of that for loop and yielding back the next value. So instead of allocating a full array of everything, you can simply go and say, and call it each time, you get one element back at a time. And that way you could save a lot of memory with a generator. So that the sister to a generator is a coroutine, you take a generator and flip it upside down. Instead of calling it and getting values back, you can send values into a generator. But when you do that, it's called a coroutine. And you can do some very interesting things. And you still use the yield keyword that says, here's where I want to receive my value. And then you can do a send into it. So you can send things in to the coroutine. And you can do some very interesting things. Nikita has written a very good article on it, on cooperative multitasking using coroutines with PHP. So if you're interested, grab the slide, click on this link, um, and read about it. I don't have time to explain coroutines fully today, but they're really cool, I think. There's a finally clause now. Finally, anything in there in the try catch, whether an exception happens or not, anything in the finally clause will get executed. So that's for any sort of cleanup um, that you need to do. You can add a list and a for each just to do the first level of dereferencing. Minor feature. We have const array and string dereferencing now, mostly for completeness. I don't find it super useful. Um, but people were complaining that we didn't have it. Nobody should be writing code like this to begin with. A few other minor features. Empty can now take um, the return values from functions or entire expressions and apply PHP's sense of emptiness to it. The curl upload functionality was kind of weird with the at symbol and, and the way that worked. So if you're uploading files via curl, have a look at the new way to do it in 5.5. You should do a little bit of, of refactoring there. Minor, um, but it's much cleaner and safer now. And in the spirit of helping scale down, making complex things accessible to people, we have a simplified password API now. Um, we've seen a lot of sites over the past five years whose pa databases or password databases got leaked or stolen somehow, and people having extremely bad hashes, or maybe not hashed at all, or hashes without salt so they're vulnerable to rainbow tables. By using password hash and password verify, you can get the right thing. You can get a safe password hash without having to know all the crypto behind it. There's nothing new here. You could do all this before, but you had to understand what assault was, why you might want to salt your hashes, right? And, and a lot of people obviously don't understand that. So by not saying, okay, don't worry about understanding it, just call password hash, you'll be fine. And we have a migration document, like for every PHP version, going from 5.4 to 5.5, read php.net migration 5.5. Has everything you need to know in there. If you're going from 5.4 or 5.3, you need to read the other ones, the 5.4 and the 5.3 documents too. 5.6, coming out soon, a um, couple of months, a couple of weeks, we'll see. Depends how the betas go. Um, new feature in 5.6, variadic functions. Using the ECMAScript syntax dot dot dot, this just means that this function takes one required element query and then a variable number of extra parameters. So it's, we could do that before with um, at the function call level, we can say, okay, give me all the, the arguments in the function call, but that didn't handle references. This now handles references perfectly, and it's a little cleaner to do it this way. So that's quite obvious. Uh, a partner feature to that is argument unpacking. So you can also use the dot, dot, dot syntax to pass stuff in. So if you have a function that takes six arguments, you can pass in two arrays, each containing three elements, for example and the dot, dot, dot will unpack it, and the receiving function doesn't need to be variadic. It doesn't need to know about this at all. You can use this for traditional functions. Um, the argument unpacking operator dot, dot, dot here will handle that for you. You can't have leading ones. You'll get a fatal error. Cannot use positional argument after argument unpacking. Um, it has to be trailing or the entire thing. 
constant scalar expressions. So now we can do things that don't need anything from the runtime. We can use, uh, we can now dereference or we can execute in the compiler um, and evaluate this and that gets cached in the opcode cache and everything of course. We've added a write associative power operator. By write associative, hopefully you understand grammars, right? So it goes right then, then left. Um, so something like negative three to the power of two is negative nine, not nine, right? Because it's gonna do the right first, it's gonna do three to the power of two, nine, and then multiply by negative one. It looks a little bit weird, it looks wrong, basically, but every language except, I think, Visual Basic does it this way. Um, and it's the right way to do it. And you don't do this anyway. This is always gonna be a variable. Um, so it's really not gonna hit you. If you're really confused, add parentheses around it if you want to make sure, but you, no one writes this code anyway. I don't think it's gonna trip anyone up. We have an internal operator overloading for features like GMP. So you can now do GMP init, and then you can use operators directly on it, and it'll just figure it out. This is internal operator overloading only. Other extensions will hopefully start using it too. We have a use function. So you can now import functions and namespaces into classes, into, name, into namespaces, sorry. And a bunch of SSL related fixes because OpenSSL has been interesting for the past year or so. Um, so we've really had a look at our OpenSSL integration and there's a lot of things in there um, that has been beefed up. Nothing backward compatibility changing stuff, but just completing the API basically, giving you access to more of OpenSSL. You can also do asynchronous Postgres queries now, just like you can with MySQLi for MySQL. Support for greater than two gigabyte file uploads um, and a couple of other minor improvements here and there. Again, migration document, PHP 5.6. All right, that was the coding part. For me, that's the boring part. Like I said earlier, I don't like programming. I do it because it's a tool that I need to solve problems that I'm interested in. This is how I see the world. We've got dreamers that tend to be they're interesting but mostly useless. We have coders, very, very useless but very boring. And then in the middle is where I find things to be interesting. The people who dream but also have some basis in reality. The dreamers can dream up stupid things. Like, I want a train that goes 10 times faster than every other train. Hey, that's my idea. Also known as a patent troll, right? It's like, hey, I'm gonna patent trains that are 10 times faster. I'm not gonna build it, because I don't know how to build this thing, but it's my idea. 10 times faster trains. Then, 20 years down the road, some brilliant engineer comes up with a way of actually building a train that goes 10 times faster without killing all the passengers. And then this guy, the patent troll, goes, hey, that was my idea. Like, but, but it's stupid. An idea is mostly worthless without an implementation. And most of the patent trolls are like that. And most of the dreamers are like that. I can't count how many times I've had VCs and others come to me and say, look, I just need a technical co-founder because I have this idea. Like, I don't need you. <laughs> you need someone to actually build things and do all the work. I don't need you. Ideas are cheap. It's the ideas that come from the hackers who actually know, the, the engineer who knows how to build a train that's 10 times faster and can actually do it. That's interesting. And that's where the world gets changed when, when the hackers get involved and the hackers who understand the world, understand what can be done, how to do it, and have a good idea on top of that. That's when things get interesting. The world is a big place. This is me when I was less than a year old. I was born in Greenland, and this was my first toy at something called Nyonosphere Station in a very remote part of Greenland. This was the house I lived in. This was the nearby town, which wasn't actually that close and had about 300 people. This is downtown. So the point of this is I come from a place where the internet is irrelevant. Nobody cares about the internet. Most of the people in the world, like 60%, don't care about the internet. They're worried about getting food, getting clean water, getting just basics of 
living out there. We're doing a piss poor job of addressing those parts of the world. We are building things like Instagram and Pinterest and things that just don't matter. If these things went away tomorrow, the world would be no worse off at all. And I would say 99% of all the sites written in PHP, we don't need. They could go away and nobody would care. So I think we're running out of things that can be solved just by sitting behind our keyboards. We need to get out there a little bit. We need to look around. We need to see how can we be more useful. And it's not just us, obviously. We have a problem with the fact that the VCs are pouring money into stupid stuff. But they're pouring in money into stupid stuff because hackers come and say, oh, I want to build this stupid thing. Give me, give me money, stupid VC. It's like, OK, I'll give you money, and we might make lots of money. But what did we actually do? So it's a combination. We need the hackers to come up with better ideas, and we need the VCs to stop funding stupid things that motivates the hackers to do stupid things, basically. Um, some of the things that I like out there done with PHP, Sahana, awesome projects. It's a project that helps um, for disaster relief. So if a huge disaster happens, it's kind of disaster relief management in the box. Um, you, you install it, deploy it, off you go. You have a complete system for helping find lost relatives, for making aid that comes into various airports, go to the right places where it's needed. It's an amazing package. Um, and I like the quote from the, this Secretary of National Defense of the Philippines, right? No innovation matters more than that which saves lives. And Sahana has actually saved people's lives. And it's written in PHP, amazing project. Not everyone can work on something like this, and there's not a whole lot of money in it. But there is money in addressing the needs of people like this. Where is Facebook's next billion users going to come from? Everyone with, in, with an internet account already has a Facebook account. How is Facebook going to get another billion users? They're going to have to get out there to some of these folks that don't have internet. These folks are not motivated by Facebook. People who have trouble making a living, they're not going to sit and play around on Facebook. That just wastes time, right? But if you build a service that motivates these folks, that can help them earn a living, that motivates them to get on the internet, then Facebook might get their next billion users, but it's actually you that got them on the internet. And if you're first in markets like this, there's a lot of money to be made. I am out of time, I'm told. So let's go to some questions, please. Do you want this? Until there's a question, these folks in the picture are actually some people we've been trying. I work for Etsy, and it's a shopping site for basically handmade arts and crafts. So this guy is a potter in the middle of Mexico, and we were helping him set up an Etsy shop. So instead of selling his amazing plates for a dollar to some middleman who turns around and sells it for $300 at Mexico airport, he can now sell it for $280 on Etsy and get, he gets $279.50 or something from that. We take a tiny little cut. So part of this, making the world a better place, is providing more value than you extract. A lot of companies don't do that. A lot of companies extract way more value than they actually provide to the user. If more companies could turn that around and provide more than they take out, I think the world would be a better place. Do we have any questions now? I'll keep talking until we have some. <laughs> so the question was, what's my opinion on one lecture per child? One, the one laptop per child project. It, it hasn't gone too well. <laughs> I would love to see it. Um, stuff like the Mozilla phone as well, getting a cheap phone into the hands of, of some of these people, for example. I mean, one of my problems, getting an Etsy shop into the middle of rural Mexico, is that they have no internet, they have no bank account, and they have no way to ship. So they can't ship their product, they can't accept payments, and they can't list it, right? Those are fundamental problems that it's hard for me to solve. If I have to first provide internet access to all of Mexico, yikes. And then I have to fix their shipping system. 
And then I have to provide banking services, right? That's a lot of problems. If the Mozilla phone or one laptop per child, if all these things can sort of go together, say, okay, it's very easy to get an, a laptop, it's very easy to get a smartphone, um, then my job becomes easier. I would love to see the Facebooks and the Microsoft and the bigger companies that have a vested interest in getting more people online, I would love to see them pushing a bit more. I mean, Google has been doing some work with their weird balloon internet access and those various projects, right? Um, but those are the companies that need to get out there and push this. The Facebooks, right? I mean, I said, where are they going to get their next billion users? They have to get more people online. And if they help, and if I provide some services that actually motivates, like this guy, he's not going to go online just for Facebook. But he might go online to sell his pottery for $280 versus $2. That would motivate him. That would change his life. You guys are shy. Come on. Um, uh, what's your point of view uh, about teaching uh, to kids uh, to code in school? So, education is obviously a huge problem. I was just in South Africa six weeks ago or something, and South Africa must have one of the world's worst educational systems out there. And it's really hard because if they can't do basic math to begin with, teaching them to code is rough. And, and a lot of the kids have no clean water, they have no, they have no shoes, they have no food. Right? You can't teach kids to program until you provide basic human conditions for them. So I, I think that's the next step. I, I think we first have to make sure that the kids are in a position to learn. Um, in, in countries like France, that's obviously not a problem. The, the kids have what they need to learn. And in that case, yes, we should be teaching kids to code, not in any specific language. My son is 12 years old, so I have some experience in this. And he is going crazy. He can build anything in Scratch, for example. It's an MIT project, if you're interested, scratch.mit.edu. It's a very visual programming language. But he can take any, almost any smartphone game and clone it in about a day in Scratch, um, it, as long as it's not too complicated. But any sort of simple looking game. I showed him 2048 a couple of weeks ago, for example, and it took him like three hours, and he had 2048 implemented completely, and he's 12, right? He can't write a PHP application, but he can whip out anything he wants in, in Scratch. Taking that in a couple of years and, and moving that knowledge of loops and variables and conditions and all that to PHP will be simple. Um, so I think the key is just finding a way of connecting with the kids and motivating them. Um, once they're motivated, and he's motivated by building games and showing them to his friends. And they all sort of try to show off to each other and building the cooler games. And that's what motivates them, right? Other kids might be motivated by other things. But once you find that catch, they just take off. It's natural for kids these days. What's the... Which, any specific RFC, or maybe I missed part of the question? Just the overall future of PHP? <laughs> That's kind of a broad question. Um, I mean, we're, we're plodding along. We're doing the next, we're coming up with 5.6. We have various RFCs for features for 6.0. Um, Dimitri has some cool stuff for PHP NG. Um, there's work on 64-bit. There's work on lots of different things. Um, Unicode has been a bit of a, a problem for us obviously, uh, because it's a tough problem. I went into it thinking, hey, this isn't that hard. But then you start looking at ICU, and you start looking at the complexity and, and the performance penalty that you take. And then you ask people, it's like, no, well, Unicode is nice, but I don't want to take a 30% performance hit. Because I know my character set. I don't actually care about other people's character sets um, until you do. but. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't care. Um, and it's hard and it's complicated. I'm still looking for this white knight 
Unicode library that's super, super fast and lightweight and just solves everything for me. Um, I'm not sure when that's going to show up, though. Because right now, I mean, ICU, when we tried it before with ICU, this was before ICU became more modular. But back then, it was like we added a little bit of PHP to ICU. Because ICU was an order of magnitude more code than all of PHP at the time. So we just sort of did a little bit of PHP enhancement to the ICU project. Um, and that just felt completely wrong to everybody. It's a little bit better now. And but we're still not going to get there with PHP 6. It's, it's not going to be the full Unicode everywhere that I would like to see just because we haven't found a good way of making this fast and reliable and, and, and something people actually would want. But, I mean, so the immediate future is still going to be a PHP 6 or whatever we call it um, with the shopping list of things that you can see on the wiki site from the various RFCs. And the exact features are going to depend on the implementation. A lot of things that people say, hey, why haven't they added uh, name parameters yet, for example? That's completely because we haven't had a good implementation yet. There's lots of people that say, hey, we want name parameters. That's fine. Where is it? Right? Someone actually has to write the code. It's not like we're sitting there saying, no, 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 we, we don't want to put it in. We're saying, no, 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 to specific implementations of it, saying, well, this implementation is horrible. We can't put that in because it slows everything down, seg faults everywhere. It just doesn't work. And that's where I think there is some uh, confusion between some of the PHP community that don't follow very closely. They just see us voting no on things. But they don't see the discussion behind it. They don't understand that, no, we're not voting no on the feature necessarily. We're voting no on this particular implementation of, of the feature because it just doesn't work, right? Um, so that's why you might see no, no, no votes on the same feature, and then suddenly a yes vote from everybody. And everyone will say, hey, why did you change your mind? Well, because we now have a properly implemented solution for this particular feature. And that's, that's all going to build into the future of PHP. It's just contributions, decent implementations of features that make sense to the language. And we'll see where it goes. We don't have a grand plan. It's, it's a voluntary project. It's hard to predict what people will be interested enough in to implement and contribute. Um, I don't have a team of 100 developers. I can just tell, you should work on this, you should work on that. That's not how it works. I'm one of many. I don't do much coding anymore. And we just have to see what flows in through the door and then pick and choose the things that make sense. Um, I just want to ask, uh, what do you think about the H HVM? Um, so the hack language, basically, or HHVM. Um, I, I like it. I've been watching them for a long time now. Their initial implementation of hip hop was crazy. Uh, translate to C++ and compile was just completely insane. Um, but the JIT is, is very interesting. I think a future version of PHP will be JIT-based, whether it's HHVM or another JIT. There are other companies that also have PHP JITs out there. Um, they haven't released them, but they're, they're using them currently. So I think for PHP 7 or PHP 8 or some future version, we will probably look very, very uh, hard at using one of these existing JITs as the engine. HHVM is nowhere near ready. It's nowhere near broad enough, portable enough, uh, complete enough to be the engine for, for something like PHP 6, for example. But three, four years down the road, I could easily see something like HHVM being the, the new engine for PHP itself. Est-ce qu'il y a une dernière question? Um, I just read on the internet that PHP is not a really asynchronous language, and then you've introduced uh, the notion of asynchronous. So is it a real asynchronous? Or thank you. Right, and because you read it on the internet, it's it's obviously true. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I mean it, PHP is not that asynchronous. That's true. Most of the things that you might want to do asynchronously, though, you can. 
So mm -hmm. we have full support for select, for example. So you can, you can send off, if you're doing, say, a bunch of, of just fetching files from 10 different sites at the same time, you can send those off and then F open them all and in your select loop, you'll get triggered each time one of them returns. Um, both MySQL and Postgres, you can now asynchronously send requests to them. We also have lib event extensions, so anything basically you can make asynchronous. So there's also, um, what's it called? There's a, if you look at nodephp.org, I think, someone has, has basically recreated Node.js, but using PHP, using lib event. There's basically nothing that you can't do asynchronously in PHP. It's just not the default and it's not as obvious as it is in some other languages. But for the pieces, usually it's only certain places where you want asynchronicity anyway. Um, and it's not that hard to dig in and see, okay, here's how we're going to make this particular piece asynchronous in PHP. So yes, your internet thing of saying PHP is not as good asynchronously as others is probably true but it doesn't mean that you can't do anything you want to do asynchronously in PHP. Okay, bah merci Rasmus. Merci.